Thank you for the opportunity to speak on uh, this topic. The mission organization of the Canadian Reformed Churches it has been something that I have uh, thought about, wondered about ever since I came to Canada 15 years ago. But since I was new to Canada, I thought, yeah, who am I to say something about the way the Canadian Reformed Churches organize their things? I did write an article about this um, for the Festschrift for Dr. Van Dam in 2011. But I guess, yeah, nobody read it. <laughs> so uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. At least um, I, it gave me an opportunity to think about it some more. I'm very glad that this morning we can, we can tackle this issue a little bit, and I'm also very thankful for the speech that we already heard from uh, Brother Richard Bout. You will notice that many of the things are quite parallel. The, what they are going through, working through in the URC, coming out of the CRC where there was this top-down bureaucratic structure, then you go to decentralized, and now you try to centralize things a bit more. I think we are going through the same process. By way of introduction, the Canadian Reformed Churches have a unique approach to organizing their uh, global mission projects. In the church order, we have Article 51, which says the churches shall endeavor to fulfill their missionary task. When churches cooperate in this matter, interesting formulation, when churches cooperate in this matter, they shall as much as possible observe the division into classes and regional synods. So you gather the idea, churches are to do it, uh, they can do it on their own, that's not a problem. If you want to send out a missionary to another country in the world, you can do that. If you want to cooperate with others, that's fine, but then you need to take into account that do it with churches in your, in your classes. So. Uh, what we have is this structure. We have a church like in Toronto who sends out a missionary to PNG. A cluster of churches support that work. Then we have the church in Hamilton sending out a missionary to Brazil. Some churches support that work. And Elder Grove, same thing, Brazil. That's the way it has been for the last 60, 70 years. And we don't have anything beyond that. We do not have what most other churches have in the Reformed and Presbyterian world, um, what could be called a central mission committee that is appointed by synod. In fact, um, our synods are not supposed to talk about mission, and our classes and our um, regional synods are not supposed to, uh, maybe they can pray for it, but they are not supposed to do any business about missions because we believe, we have believed that missions is the task of a local church, not the task of the churches in common. So you go to, a, I have been to mission meetings, um, meetings of mission executives of NAPARC and ICRC, and then you meet brothers who serve on the mission board for their denomination. Uh, you meet someone like uh, Richard, you meet someone like Mark Bube for the OPC, he's the general secretary. He's been general secretary appointed by Senate for many years. He's the one who visits their mission fields. He goes there to give advice and encourage and they oversee a lot of the work. Man with a huge expertise. So you, you meet all these men, and then I come away from a meeting like that thinking, yeah, there is something very good and beautiful about um, some centralization about mission work, because that's where you bring expertise and wisdom together. So in this paper, I want to answer the question whether, as Canadian Reformed Churches, we should perhaps revamp our model, our organizational model of doing missions, and by the end, you will see that the question mark at the end is going to be gone. Um, but we need some historical background, just like Richard did in the case of the URC. Um, 
In fact, we have to go back to 1896. I'll try to be quick. Um, so think back, the history of the Reformed Churches in the Netherlands. There was the union of the Churches of the Secession and the Churches of the Doleancy that happened in 1892. So ch two church federations got together and they had to figure out how to work together in many areas, also in the area of mission. They had two approaches that were different. The secession churches were more centralized in their approach. They had a central mission committee that oversaw their mission work in the Dutch East Indies. The Doliancy churches, Kuiper, um, Rutgers, professor of church polity, were very firm on the independence, the responsibility of a local church. Um, so they had to figure that out. And eventually, things happened. The Synod of Middleburg, Abraham Kuyper was there. There were two reports, a majority report and a minority report. They couldn't uh, agree. Then the Synod said, Abraham, or they said Dr. Kuyper, um, can you please uh, work something out for us? Uh, I think that's the way it went. So Kuiper went home, worked on it that evening and into the night. And the next morning he came with a, a proposal and it was adopted by Synod. Uh, although it was the committee report, but it, Abraham had written it. And these are the principles that he worked with. with. So Kuiper's principles for foreign mission. Number one, foreign mission is the mandate, mandate of the church, not a society. Very basic we as churches should be sending out missionaries to our foreign mission fields. Number two, missionaries should be sent out and supervised by local churches, not by major assemblies. That was a choice that he made, which was a bit different from the Dutch tradition. If you go back far enough and you go back to the 17th century, there is a name, Wutzius, Gisbertus Wutzius. The students will uh, know about him, I think because uh, he wrote in several areas. Uh, Fuchs had written about mission and how to do mission, and Fuchs had said, when you read the New Testament, um, you have Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the church in Antioch, so that you see an example of a local church sending out missionaries. But there is also another chapter in Acts, I forget which one it was, no, it's not in Acts. It's in uh, Corinthians, where Paul writes about his work, and then he refers to a brother who is working with him, traveling with him, and then he says, These, this man, this brother was appointed by the churches to accompany me for the work that the Lord has given us. And then Vucci said, you see, the Bible also leaves room for churches, in plural, working together, sending out missionaries. So early on in the Dutch Republic, um, you had, for example, classes Amsterdam, classes Amsterdam that sent out missionaries to, I think even to uh, New Amsterdam here in, uh, in the US when New York was still a Dutch place. So Kuiper said, well, that's actually not good. Uh, classes should not be doing that. A local church should send out a missionary and supervise his work. But, then we come to number three, the churches together at synodical level should formulate a set of guidelines to which sending churches bind themselves. And even four, synod should appoint mission deputies, so a central commission, a central mission uh, committee, to help the sending churches with advice and to facilitate consultation and cooperation. It's a free translation of what Kuiper said. His argument for was, yes, a local church should send out a missionary. Uh, that's the only way to do it. However, a local church is limited in manpower, in expertise. It's a complicated work. So the churches in general should help those local churches where, by setting up a committee uh, of experts or whatever you call them, people with some experience, so that they can help those sending churches with advice and, and their expertise and so forth. 
Another thing that is not on here is that it was suggested that the church should also develop a mission order. So we have a church order, as you know, it's in the book, but they also started to develop a mission order which was connected to the one article in the church order that speaks about the mission task. So that one article got a, a big attachment that was called the mission order, the sendings order in Dutch. It started small, became bigger. It had things about how, how do we train missionaries, how do we appoint them, how do we supervise them, can missionaries use evangelists, native evangelists on the mission field, how does that work? What, uh, are the, what's the authority of evangelists? Can they, uh, can they celebrate Lord's Supper, uh, lead Lord's Supper, can they preach? Things like that. So, you see there was a mix of local initiative, local supervision over missionaries, but also denominational help and advice. That was the idea. What happened after 19, 1896? Well, mission work was initiated, resumed, promoted, done in the East Indies, uh, present-day Indonesia, which was a Dutch colony. Um, and the mission work grew, more and more missionaries, doctors, nurses, teams. It was blessed, it was beautiful. Um, at the same time, the mission order that I refer to also expanded over the years. More and more things were added to regulate things. And the third thing, the role of the Central, Commission, Central Mission Committee expanded. So that uh, committee appointed by Synod, um, its role, its power grew over time and you got what Richard described with the CRC, that you have a bureaucracy of brothers who are the experts and who have the authority and who more and more were taking the decisions about what was happening in the field with frustrations happening on the fields because you're a missionary, you want to do something, you have to ask permission at the Central Missions Committee and they have their own mind, they say no and you're stuck. And there was also frustration with the sending churches because they felt that what are we actually doing? The Central Missions Committee is, is doing everything, and the name for that was, it has become Deputaten Zending, meaning mission by the deputies, not by the churches anymore. So that was a big frustration. Then in 1944, the well-known number, we had, of course, the liberation. And if you know a little bit about the history of the liberation, there was a big backlash against hierarchy. You had a synod in 1944 uh, that had uh, taken certain decisions, cert certain things uh, in their own, uh, without being authorized to do that. They had deposed Skilder, Redanus. So the, the atmosphere in the churches was, this should never happen again. And we don't want hierarchy in the churches. Uh, from now on, we are going to leave with the local churches what, what the local churches can do. And then there was the frustration with that mission committee that had become too powerful. So there was a general atmosphere in the liberated churches that never again are we going to have a mission uh, committee. Um, it's going to be the local churches that are going to do it. The, the things were written about it. For example, there is a, a brochure that was written by a, uh, Reverend Dorn Boss about um, what is a reformed mission um, and he defended the idea that uh, missions should be done by the local church and major assemblies have no business in uh, talking about, about it. The same Reverend Dorn Boss was a delegate to the Synod in Kampen 1951 and that Synod took drastic decisions with respect to how do we do foreign missions. Um, it deleted a lot of stuff from the church order. The whole mission order was deleted. No more mission order. Uh, the central mission committee was discontinued. No more committee um, appointed by synod. From now on, 
uh, local churches are invited to initiate foreign mission projects. And uh, that's it. For, for the rest, we don't need anything. And the decisions of Kampen 51 were hailed by many as a victory over hierarchy and the liberation of the mission work. From now on, uh, we can do the work and uh, the Lord is going to bless us. Uh, some are a bit more cautious. Um, Dr. Skilder, after the Synod, he died in 52, but he still wrote um, the end of the year overview. Uh, he reflected on that decision and he wrote this. The mission deputies, as a top-down functioning institution, are no more. We understand this, and we agree with the rationale to do this, and thus we agree with the decision as well. Time will tell, however, whether there may not be a need arising from the grassroots level to appoint general advisory committees. There is so much in common that needs to be thought through. Right, in the 1950s, people started to come to Canada. So they had just gone through the liberation, the backlash against hierarchy, the deletion of the church, the mission order, and everything has, is, is going to be local in our approach. Um, the earlier immigrants had missed Kampen 1951, so they still were in the, in the mindset of, oh, when we have our first synod here in Canada, we need to set up a, a mission committee so that we can go look for a mission field. But then the later immigrants knew about not, Kampen 51, and they, it was interesting because at the first synod, 1954, there were proposals to appoint a central commission, central mission committee, but then there were letters that, no, this is not reformed. We should never appoint a central committee. A mission is the task of the local church. So at synod, that party had the upper hand, and uh, the synod took the earlier proposals for information. It was considered inappropriate to talk about mission at General Synod because it's the task of the local church. What happened next was there was a, a meeting in Carmen, 1958. Um, not a synod. It was a meeting of delegates of churches. And the brothers got together to talk about, okay, we are not talking about mission at classes or synod, but we want to do something, so here we are now. How are we going to do mission? They were not able to take any decisions, but they were able to set direction. So they set direction with respect to three important issues. Dutch New Guinea, or what we call Papua today, not PNG, but the other, other side, was going to be the mission field. Number two, Toronto was asked to become the sending church, and all the other churches would be supporting Toronto. And they also wrote a draft agreement of cooperation that outlined the mandate of the sending church and the support of the cooperating churches. So as the Canadian Reformed churches grew in numbers over time, that all developed, a few more mission fields were added, a few more congregations took up the task of being sending churches. So it was Toronto, and then it was Surrey, I think, and Hamilton, and a lot later, Elder Grove, and for, uh, yeah, uh, Smithville, etc. Um, so you know the, the structure. Those of you who are Canadian Reformed, you have a sending church, and then there is a cluster of churches that support that work. And our churches have never had national or denominational mission deputies. There is no central mission office. And whether the sending churches want to cooperate about something that is left up to their initiative. So the only thing that has basically changed is that we have this platform, the CRMA, the Canadian Reformed Missions Association, which was established in 2011 as a, uh, we had to be very careful it was not going to have any powers. It was only going to be a platform where we can meet 
and talk to each other and invite a few speakers. Uh, and now we also have a website, so you have to be careful. Um, it's growing. Uh, but I remember that in those years there was some pushback. Okay, you guys are starting something together. We can see where this is going. This, this is going to end up being something hierarchical. Um, so there, were a, there was some critique. And okay, maybe I'm, I should not have mocked it. I don't want to mock it because even though I feel we should centralize more, I also have this fear in my own heart what if we started? What is going to be after 20, 30 years? Are we going to end up having a big bureaucracy again? So often you see the pendulum swing in history. Now, before I talk more about this, a quick look at developments in Holland after 1944. Um, yeah, four or five sending churches all sent missionaries to Papua. You hear that? four or five churches in Holland, each sent a missionary to Papua. So you had a church in, in Spakenburg, for example, sent a missionary to a village in, in the jungle in Papua, and then the church in Groningen sent a, a missionary to the next village upstream, and then the church in Enschede sent a missionary. Reverend Versteeg can tell you all about it because he was there uh, during those years. So. What could easily happen was if the missionaries didn't agree about something, that each one would write to his own sending church, and then the sending churches would end up disagreeing about the same thing. There was a lot of confusion. And they had to learn that, yeah, you can say mission is the task of the local church, but you have to talk together, you have to cooperate. Um, so the churches started to reassess their model, they had to. And uh, one of my professors in Kampen, Kamphuis Senior, already in the 70s, wrote in uh, a piece that Kampen 1951 had inflicted serious wounds. That was his terminology. And he, sub he, he suggested that the churches should reinstate a kind of mission order. And later on, Case Haag, himself a missionary and then lecturer in missiology in Kampen, he referred to the decisions of Kampen 1951 as a dark moment in the history of mission work. So the Dutch churches came to the conclusion that this decentralized approach doesn't work very well. We have to centralize more. Um, that's what they did. Long story short, by now, the Dutch mission work is completely the other way. Everything has been centralized again, the Veranasten. Um, and now you get complaints that, oh, actually, is it, are we back to, to a, a powerful bureaucracy that takes all the decisions? It seems to be hard to get it right. Uh, okay, there's an yeah. evaluation for the churches in Canada. I'm going to attempt to evaluate the strengths and the weaknesses of the model of the Canadian Reformed Churches. So I, I try to be objective about it. Strengths, I think number one, the ecclesiastical position of missionaries is clear. You have a sending church, that church uh, sends you out, takes care of you, uh, they supervise your work, you report back to them, sometimes they come visit you, etc. and when you go on furlough or when you repatriate, that's your home church. That's clear. Clear structure, important. Number two, another strength, the connection between the sending church and the missionary is usually strong. Uh, this, this missionary is our missionary, and when he comes back to Canada, he comes back to us, and we provide for him, and we pray for him, and we know about his wife and his children and all those things as a strong connection. Good for the mission support, good for the missionary. Number three, you have this local mission board now, so a sending church usually appoints a local uh, mission board that does most of the work. They get uh, involved a lot, they are volunteers, but over time, especially if they stay on the committee, they, they build up expertise and there's a lot of love that go, goes into the work and you know, a lot of wisdom as well. 
So you get a, an intense collaboration that way. Those are the strength, strengths. Now the weaknesses, despite what I just said about members of local mission boards building up expertise over the years, I still believe that it is difficult to build up that expertise because the people on the mission board are all volunteers. They have their jobs. They do it as best as they can, but they have not been missionaries or in mission work, so they, it's a long learning curve before they are able to understand what's going on on the mission field and to, to take decisions with... You, know, you take some, some big decisions sometimes without well, hoping, okay, I, I hope I'm doing the right thing, but I don't really know. And then you wish that there were people with expertise who could say, oh, I've, I've seen this happening on the mission field and we solved the issue, this and this. Yeah, so that's, that's hard when you have a local mission board. It's hard to build up expertise and our system makes it hard to build up expertise because the way it goes, you have some members who can stay on for long, but usually there is a, a bit of a turnover. So you have new members coming on the mission board. They don't have that expertise. And then there are some complex issues that come from the, from the mission field. And, and how are you going to handle that? Another thing that I, I see ha happening sometimes, while the mission board keeps rejuvenating and with working with inexperienced people, the missionary gets more and more experienced. So if you have a missionary who's been on the field for 20 years and the mission board is a bit inexperienced, who are they to tell him what he should do? And it's very hard for a missionary to still think, oh, I should actually listen to them. The missionary, that's a challenge for a missionary. You already are a, a kind of a person who, who know, you know how to, to do your own thing. And now you get a letter from Hamilton or from Aldergrove, and they say, uh, no, we don't like this or this, We'd rather do this. The temptation is, what do they know? I am on the field. I know what I'm doing. Um, so, those are some weaknesses of, uh, of our system. Um, also, because we do not have a central mission committee, there is not really an address for a local mission board to go to. If we had someone like Richard Bout, for example, we could say, okay, let's, let's call Richard Bout and ask his advice on this question. Now, I think some of our mission boards call him anyway which is a, a good thing to do, and the, we sort of piggyback with the United Reformed Churches. But you see that there is a need then for uh, that, that kind of advice. Second, um, so I said earlier that there is a strong connection between the sending church and its missionary. I'm not so sure about this one, but I have the impression that the connection of the other churches, the supporting churches, can easily grow weaker um, because they, they are not that closely connected to, to the missionary. I, I see that happening that, well, I'm in the Hamilton area, so we support Reverend De Graaf, and I hear that yeah, some churches want to break away from, from the cooperation and support something else. Something more exciting, or what is it? I, I'm not always sure. Um, I heard about a church recently. Actually, the minister talked to me about it. Yeah, our, our church wants to, uh, to get out of Hamilton Corporation, and, and we want to, st to start uh, supporting something local. Uh, yeah, so you see that, I, can, I hear that more often now. Why, why is that? Why? There are probably various reasons for this, but I, th I see it happening. I hear more often about it. Maybe the reason is also that uh, some... One reason, I think, is the fact that it's just in the air that church planting here in Canada is, acting, is actually the thing of our time. This, this is exciting. Everybody wants to do it. And foreign mission now sounds like that's something of the past. That's what the grandfathers did. Another reason might be that some other organizations are doing a better job at promoting and PR than our mission churches. Um, 
think of uh, organizations like CRWRF, Word and Deed, they have people on staff who take care of the promotion of things. So they, they can organize very nice activities um, that attract people. Okay, I don't have time to get into the details, but they just have people to do it. And here you have a local mission board, it's volunteers. They don't have the time to do that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the weaker connection of supporting churches. Third, and this is actually a more important one for, for me, our system makes it difficult to do strategic thinking about mission work or to respond to global opportunities. Richard mentioned the same thing as a reason for why they want to change their system. Um, we don't have anything, we don't have a body or an institution that can do this for us. Hamilton has its hands full focusing on Brazil. We cannot expect that local mission board to also think about, okay, what other opportunities are there in the world? What other new fields are there where we should go? Same with Aldergrove. Those local churches have their hands full on, on their ta with their task. And then beyond that, we don't have anything. The, that can do this for the churches. Um, there's no central mission board, and I've had it. You visit a place in Africa, and there is someone is asking, who could I approach in, in your churches in Canada to, to see if, if, if you guys can, can help us for, with mission work? Yeah, I, I don't know who you can approach. We, we don't have that, we don't have an address that can speak for the churches. In conclusion, I believe that the missionary organization of the CANRC has significant weaknesses and that the time has come for the churches to address the issue. And I, I want to say at the same time that the Lord has thankfully blessed our foreign mission efforts tremendously. So I'm not negative about anything that has happened with all this volunteer work and, and local uh, churches doing the work. And in, in a sense, organization is only organization. In the end, it depends on the people who do the work. And if you have people of integrity who, who do the work, the work will get done and, and it will get blessed. But still, organization is important. So I believe that our current organizational model prevents the churches from building up expertise, from being versatile and flexible enough to be able to respond to the missionary challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. And if we are not going to do anything, I predict that we will see increasing fragmentation. In other words, that we will see more and more churches withdrawing from the existing cooperation groups, clusters. Um, so Hamilton is going to lose more churches, and, and so are the other churches, because churches want to do their own thing. Or even support a mission project of another denomination. Um, and that's, there's a good side to it, maybe. But there is all fragmentation. If it's just fragmentation and independentism, you know that word? That's another no-no. Okay. Suggestions for improvement? Um, let's reassess our model. We are still working with the Compton 1951 model. Well, the Dutch churches have long said goodbye to it. And let's reconsider the model before that. That was the 90, 1896 model, as presented by Kuiper, um, where you had a, a bit of a hybrid between, yes, local mission, yes, local churches sending out missionaries, but also the churches in general helping with advice and expertise. Consider two changes. Reintegrate the reporting about mission projects in the regular ecclesiastical structures. I'm not exactly sure how that would work. Um, I feel that this needs to be looked into, maybe a committee, uh, by synod. Um, how, how, something like what Richard and his committee are doing now for the URCNA, I believe we should do something like that uh, and, and find a way to combine the the centralized and the decentralized approach. Secondly, appoint a central mission committee to assist sending churches and missionaries 
with expertise and advice. So, um, I say this with trepidation because, as I said earlier, I think we should have more centralized things adding to our system. And one reason why I hesitate to push for it is my fear that oh, maybe over time you will see that the pendulum is going to swing all the, um, the other way. And we, in 30 years, we will, we will have a bureaucracy, uh, people in an office who rule, who rule the mission work. And we don't want that. So, my ideal would be that the churches reassess our organizational model and that we, we try to come up with a model that would guard against the two extremes, guard against the independentism and the, the decentralized approach that prevents us from building up expertise, but also guards us against going back to an overly centralized approach. So, I hope someone will write a, a proposal to the next synod of the Canadian Reformed Churches that could read something like this. <laughs> synod appoints a committee to investigate the current organizational models of the URCNA and the OPC for their world mission projects to see to what extent they are feasible for the CANRC to use for our world mission projects, and if so, to make specific recommendations for how this can be implemented. Now, a church polity professor should look at this, and it's not, it's not well worded, but something like this. Thank you. <laughs>